Hello, my name is Eric Wilson, and uh, I'm also known as Maletti Vivlon. I have a blog uh, called Berean Pickets. Actually, it's one of several uh, websites. The Berean Pickets website is specifically designed to uh, review the doctrines and teachings of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. And uh, I've been on vacation for, oh, it's been about five weeks now. I'm retired, so I can take extended vacations. Um, visiting friends, family in Florida, my, my sister. And uh, then I went down to Central America for a couple of weeks to visit a brother and sister down there who uh, have also awakened. Um, good, uh, a good couple. And there are many like them all over, all over the world, really, who are awakening to the reality of the organization of Jehovah's Witnesses and striving to walk that delicate line between being out, but at the same time uh, not revealing their true feelings for fear of the persecution that comes, which is what really this video is, is about. The reason I bring this up now, it's a little bit out of the path I wanted to follow in, in releasing videos. I did want to do one on the judicial process of Jehovah's Witnesses, but that was going to be a little further down the line. So I'm actually bringing that more to the front of the, of the line right now. Because while I was in Florida, I got a call from the, well, one of the elders. I assume he's the coordinator, but I may be wrong. Definitely the chairman of the committee, of a judicial committee that was uh, appointed to uh, judge me on the basis of apostasy. Now, I kind of expected this a long time ago, but it never came about. I haven't been attending meetings in any congregation, let alone that one, which was the last congregation I attended for almost four years. So one has to wonder, what's their motivation? Why now? What do they hope to gain in dealing with this situation? And of course, there are many issues that have to be uh, examined, but we'll get to that in a minute. Anyways, we established that I couldn't make it for the attended date which was going to be the very next week since I was in Florida and wouldn't be back in Canada until late in March. So they rescheduled the meeting for the 1st of April. Um, so it brings to mind the whole thing about the judicial process, which I thought I'd, I'd touch on here. I won't go into great depth on it, but uh, I can say with absolute certainty that the whole of the judicial process that um, is part and parcel of being a Jehovah's Witness is completely unscriptural. The process uh, first expects the congregation to act as informers. So anyone who, who steps out of line, who sins in some way, maybe they smoke a cigarette, they get drunk, or do something like commit fornication, um, they're to be encouraged to report to the elders, but if they don't immediately report, then uh, the brother or sister who knows about it is supposed to inform the elders. There's nothing in the Bible to support that particular rule. Uh, if the brother or sister doesn't inform, they're actually considered to be complicit in this sin for not informing. So it turns the congregation into a large group of informers. Again, something totally out of keeping with Christianity. The next step is the elders then decide whether or not a sin has been committed that needs to be dealt with because every sin has to be confessed to the men of the body of elders, a committee that they designate, much like Catholics expect parishioners to confess their sins. So while the witnesses say they do not pardon sins like the Catholics, the reality is that they do. They, it is up to them to decide whether or not that person can remain in the congregation. If they're disfellowshipped, then basically they're cast out and considered to be rejected by God. If they remain cast out by the elders, then the idea is that if Armageddon were to come, they would die along with the rest of the wicked world. So it is very much men forgiving sin. The committees are held in secret, and the decision is not to be questioned, nor to be examined. And whatever decision they make, for example, the fellowshipping, is simply reported to the congregation, with the congregation getting no sense of what the sin was, or the circumstances leading up to it. They are just expected to obey the elders and treat the disfellowshipped one as a pariah. Again, there is nothing in the Bible to support this. 
I don't need to go into text to disprove this because it's not there. Uh, really, those who support this idea have to come up with the texts or the scriptures to support the idea of three men committees, secret meetings in which no observers are allowed, uh, decisions made by only three men for which the entire congregation must take responsibility and obey uh, whatever decision they make. What do we have in the Bible? What does the Bible actually say? Because it does support the idea of shunning to some degree. But what does it actually say? Well, there is one scripture in which Jesus gave us instruction. And it's interesting, there's only one. Uh, in those three verses we're going to read, you find all that there is to be found for dealing with sin in the congregation from Jesus' point of view. Uh, the apostles added a little bit of refinement to the understanding of it, but they didn't go beyond what Jesus said. That would be wrong. What Jesus said was all we need. Let's read them. Matthew 18, 15 to 17. Moreover, if your brother commits a sin, go and reveal his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. Let's stop there. Let's say your brother commits a sin like fornication. It says, go and reveal his fault between you and him alone. Now, a witness would say, no, 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 no. This only applies to minor sins like slander or fraud. Where does it say that? Does Jesus say if your brother commits a minor sin? He simply says a sin. So all sin is involved here. We might say, but how can you let that happen? How can a person commit fornication and, and you discuss it with him and he says, you're right, I'm not going to do it anymore, and that's the end of it. The congregation has to be involved. Judgment has to be made. Punishment has to be rendered. That's Satan's system. Do the crime, do the time. That's Satan's system. That's not Jehovah's system. So Jesus is telling us now, this is how Jehovah, the Father, wants you to deal with sin in the congregation. 16 says, but if he does not listen, take along with you two or three more, so that on the testimony of two or three witnesses, every matter may be established. If he does not listen to them, speak to the congregation, not to the elders. It doesn't say to the elders. It says to the congregation. If he does not even if he does not listen even to the congregation, let him be to you just as a man of the nations and as a tax collector. There it is. Very simple. What you have here is what nowadays we call an intervention. A person who is sinning, let's say an unrepentant drunkard or a person who is promiscuous, eventually the entire congregation sits and they talk about the sin with them. They try to convince them as a collective that this is wrong. They won't have it. If he wants to remain part of the congregation, he has to change. It's that simple. And if he doesn't, then he becomes as a man of the nations or as a tax collector. Now, does that mean you wouldn't talk to him anymore? Does that mean if your father and your daughter has, you know, is committing fornication, that you would throw her out of the house and not even answer her phone if she calls or say hello to her? A man of the nations and a tax collector were people with whom the Jews had dealings. They had to have dealings. They would talk to these people but they wouldn't hang out with them. They wouldn't associate with them. They wouldn't break bread and have a great time with them, right? But again, it's a matter for personal decision. For example, our Lord Jesus Christ ate with tax collectors. He was ridiculed for this by the Pharisees, but he ate with them because he was trying to win them over to the Lord. So we're not talking about the way Jehovah's Witnesses deal with absolute utter shunning. The idea is, well, if you cut them off completely, they'll come back. Okay, that's the way the devil works. Uh, put them in jail, make them really suffer, hurt them, and that way they'll get better. But that's not the way of the Christ. The way of the Christ is love. And that's what's missing from the JW process. Okay, so... 
Again, going back to this, you have a three-stage process. Talk to them alone, in confidence. If you win them over, nobody's harmed. God forgives. Or take two or three. They need a little more convincing. Again, you win them over, they're back in the congregation. Eventually, the whole congregation is involved. Now, why is that important? Because the shunning isn't done by decree. It's not that the congregation says, oh, we must shun these people because the elders have told us to, and we must obey the elders. That puts all the responsibility on the elders, and we're dealing with a system where men rule men. But we don't have a system where men rule men. Jesus is our Lord and our leader, and he rules us, period. It's Jesus, and then everything is flat. All brothers and sisters are on an even keel. And so this allows for that, because if someone has really sinned and needs to be excluded from the congregation as 11, as a bad influence, I need to know what they did and why they did it so I can make a determination for myself and you the same and everybody else. And some will, and maybe some won't. When we go to the Corinthians, letter of the Corinthians, where there was a man uh, sinning in such a way that even pagans were offended by his sin, Paul told them to throw him out, and so they did. A few months later, perhaps six months or so, Paul realized the man had, was repentant, told him to bring him back, and his words were, this rebuke by the majority, not by all, by the majority, that wouldn't be in the case of Jehovah's Witnesses, it would be all, because all have to obey. But Paul is recognizing that each one made a determination in their heart as to how to deal with that person. And the majority took the right course. And that was enough. That was enough. That's the loving way. Each one disfellowships a person when it is merited based on their own understanding of his sin because they have full knowledge of it, not because some elder told them. If we rely on men, then we are just opening the door to an abuse of power. That is the historical reality, always has been, continues to be, even in the congregation of Jehovah's Witnesses. Okay, so that is the reality of the judicial process. It's that simple. Jesus said nothing more about it. He gave us no additional instructions. Well, if the sin is this nature, or if the sin is that nature. So, but aren't we told not to even say hello to somebody? Yes, we are. Where is that said? Is it said about sins like lying or fornication or drunkenness? No. Only in one place are we told not even to say a greeting to someone. This is what we apply to everybody, but we shouldn't. The Bible says we should only apply it in a particular case. Let's look at it. Second John, we'll start with six. It reads, and this is what love means that we go on walking according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, that you should go on walking in it. So it starts out focusing in on love. Love is the overriding factor in any dealing we have with anyone else, including judicial matters. Seven says, for many deceivers have gone in, out into the world, those not acknowledging Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh, this is the deceiver and the antichrist. Now, it's not a simple matter of saying, oh, Jesus didn't come in the flesh, of denying the existence of Jesus. In anything that, that minimizes Jesus' role as the Son of God who came in the flesh to redeem us through his ransom, that is the antichrist. That goes against the Christ. But then John gives us a little more understanding of what it means to be an antichrist. In 8, he says, look out for yourselves so that you do not lose the things we have worked to produce, but that you may obtain a full reward. Everyone who pushes ahead and does not remain in the teaching of the Christ does not have God. The one who does remain in this teaching is the one who has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your homes or say a greeting to him, for the one who says a greeting to him is a sharer in his wicked works. Well, society likes to use these phrases. They like to cherry pick a phrase. You're pushing ahead. You're not remaining in the teaching. 
but they forget the rest of it. It's not the teaching of the organization. We're not pushing ahead of the teaching of the organization and thereby becoming an antichrist. We're pushing ahead of the teaching of the Christ. We're not remaining in the teaching of the Christ. So if the organization comes up with teachings that go contrary to that of the Christ, they're the ones who are pushing ahead. If they come up with teachings that have no place in the Bible, that are unscriptural, they are the ones who are not remaining in the teaching of the Christ. It is the teaching of the Christ that is the uh, factor that differentiates between a true believer and an antichrist or a deceiver. So if there is someone who comes to us and has a teaching which is against the teaching of the Christ, that's the person we don't even say a greeting to. But notice, it's not because some man has told us this person is an apostate, a deceiver, an antichrist. Don't listen to him. No. It says if someone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, how do you know he doesn't bring the teaching unless you first listen to it? So this person is given the opportunity to teach, to say something, to preach their idea. Maybe we like it. Maybe we find he's in line with the truth. Or maybe we say, oh no, that's not in line with the truth. You're not in line with the re teaching of the Christ. You're a deceiver. Then I can make a decision for myself. The organization would say, oh no, no, no. The apostates will corrupt your mind. How silly that is. Truly, how silly. If we have the truth and someone comes to us with a lie, are we going to just drop the truth and take the lie? I don't know about you, but when I get lied to, it offends me. It makes me angry. I, I feel like the person's treating me like a fool. So if somebody's lying to me, there is no seduction there. I want nothing to do with that person. Why? Because we have the truth. It's like you have a map, right? We can all read a map. It's a simple thing to read a map. The teaching of the Christ is simple. He said to us, that God has hidden these things from the wise and intellectual, but has revealed them to babes. So if we have like a childlike approach to the truth, then we simply go with what's written. So if somebody comes along and says, oh, no, no, don't take that route, this route, which I have designed, which I've discovered through my own ability to research things and uncover secret things, chronologies, for example, or anti-typical applications. Well, we're going to say, sorry, I can read a map. Just leave me alone. So now we come to the case with uh, my particular judicial hearing. Uh, we haven't had it yet, of course. It's April 1st. But pointing out the flaws in the process, I wrote them a letter, and I wanted to share that with you. And I'll share everything that happens, of course, along the way, because nothing that is um, hidden will remain hidden. As a matter of fact, I'll open with that scripture. Let's go to that first, because I use it at the end of the letter. In the meantime, when a crowd of so many thousands had gathered together that they were stepping on one another, he started by saying first to his disciples, watch out for the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. But there is nothing carefully concealed that will not be revealed and nothing secret that will not become known. Therefore, whatever you say in the darkness will be heard in the light, and whatever you whisper in private rooms will be preached from the housetops. So with those words in mind, let's read the letter. It's written on March 3rd, 2019, to the body of elders of the Aldershot Congregation of Jehovah's Witnesses, 4025 Mainway, Burlington, Ontario. Gentlemen, I am writing concerning your summons to me to appear before a judicial committee on the charge of apostasy on April 1, 2019 at 7 p.m. at the Aldershot Kingdom Hall in Burlington. I was only a member of your congregation briefly, about a year, and I have not been a member of your congregation since the summer of 2015, nor have I been associating with any other congregation of Jehovah's Witnesses since that time. I have no contact with members of your congregation, so... I was initially at a loss to explain this sudden interest in me after such a long time. My only conclusion is that the Canada branch office of Jehovah's Witnesses has either instructed you directly or more likely through your circuit or seer to initiate this action. 
Having served as an elder myself for over 40 years, it comes as no surprise to me that everything about this flies in the face of written JW.org policy. We all know that organization or a law supersedes what is written. For instance, when I asked for the names of those who will serve on the Judicial Committee, I was tersely denied that knowledge, yet the Elder's Manual, Shepherd the Flock of God 2019 edition, gives me the right to know who they are. See uh, chapter 15, paragraph 2. Even worse is the fact that the official website of the organization tells the whole world in multiple languages that Jehovah's Witnesses do not shun former members who have chosen to leave. C. Do Jehovah's Witnesses shun former members of their religion on JW.org? Obviously, this is carefully worded PR spin to mislead non-JWs about the true nature of organization membership. That is, that you can check out, but you can never leave. Still, since I have not been associating for almost four years, calling me to a hearing to this fellowship me would seem to be a time-wasting formality. I must therefore conclude that the motivation of the branch office service desk lies elsewhere. You have no authority over me, because I do not grant you that authority, but you do exercise authority over the diminishing number of witnesses who remain faithful to the leaders of the organization, both local and at headquarters. Like the Sanhedrin, who persecuted all who followed Jesus, you fear me and those like me, because we speak truth and you have no defense against truth other than the rod of punishment in the form of shunning. John 9, 22, 16, 1 to 3, and Acts 5, 27 to 33. This is the reason that you will never engage in a Bible discussion with us. Thus, you are now using what the organization itself called a weapon of darkness back in the January 8, 1947 issue of Awake, page 27, to keep your remaining followers from learning truth by threatening them with being completely cut off from all their JW family and friends should they have any contact with those like me who back up what we say with scripture rather than the speculative self-serving interpretations of men. Our Lord Jesus said, For whoever practices vile things hates the light and does not come to the light so that his works may not be reproved. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that his works may be made manifest as having been done in harmony with God. John 3, 20 and 21. I know you men believe you walk in light, as did I when I served as an elder. However, if you truly come to the light so that your works may be made manifest as having been done in harmony with God, why do you refuse to do these things in the light of day? Why do you hide? When I asked for information regarding the hearing and writing, I was told that none would be forthcoming. In the secular courts, the accused gets written notification of the specific charges against him and discovery of all accusers, witnesses, and evidence prior to the trial. But this is not done in the case of witness judicial hearings. Elders are instructed to avoid putting anything in writing, and so the accused is blindsided when he finally sits before the judgment seat. Even during the hearing itself, secrecy is paramount. According to the latest Elders' Manual, you have to enforce these restrictions during judicial hearings. Quoting, Generally, observers are not allowed. See paragraph, chapter 15, paragraphs 12 and 13 and 15. The chairman explains that audio and video recordings of the hearing are not permitted. Chapter 16, paragraph 1. Star chambers and kangaroo courts are known for this type of justice. But using techniques that depend on darkness will only continue to bring reproach on Jehovah's name. In Israel, judicial hearings were public, held at the city gates in the full view and hearing of all entering or leaving the city, Zechariah 8.16. The only secret hearing in the Bible where the accused was denied any support or counsel or time to prepare a defense was that of Jesus Christ before the Sanhedrin. Not surprisingly, it was marked by the very abuse of authority a transparent process is designed to prevent. Mark 14, 53 to 65. 
Which of these patterns does the organization's judicial process emulate? Additionally, depriving the accused of the support of counsel, independent observers, as well as a written or recorded record of the hearing turns the vaunted JW appeal process into a sham as well. 1 Timothy 5.19 states that Christians cannot accept an accusation against an older man except at the mouth of two or three witnesses. An independent observer and or a recording would constitute two or three witnesses and allow for the possibility of winning an appeal. How can the appeal committee ever decide in favor of the accused if he can only bring one witness himself to bear against three older men? I have nothing to fear from bringing everything into the open, into the light of day as it were. If you are doing nothing wrong, then neither should you. If you bring all this into the light, then I will need what the secular courts of Canada guarantee, full disclosure of all evidence to be brought against me, as well as the names of all involved, judges, accusers, witnesses. I will also need to know the specific charges and the scriptural basis for same. This will allow me to mount a reasonable defense. You can communicate all this in writing to my mailing address or my email. If you choose not to comply with these reasonable demands, then I will still attend the meeting, not because I recognize your authority, but to fulfill in some small way the words of our Lord at Luke 12, 1. And I should have put Luke 12, 1 to 3. That was a mistake of mine. In parenthesis, nothing in this letter should be construed to imply that I am formally disassociating myself from the congregation. I will have no part in supporting what is a self-serving, harmful, and wholly unscriptural policy. I await your response. Sincerely, Eric Wilson. As to that last part, disassociation is a word not found in the Bible, nor is the principle found. There is nothing in Scripture that talks about a person disassociating themselves from the congregation and therefore requiring the entire congregation to shun that person, even to the point of not saying a hello to them. There are cases that came to light from the Australia Royal Commission where as young sisters, children, had been abused sexually, had been dealt with abominably by the congregation judicial process, and as a result were so disenchanted, so emotionally distraught that they wanted, wanted nothing to do with the congregation anymore, and so they handed in a letter. And the result was that the congregation was then required to shun these victims. So they lost all the emotional support they needed to recover from one of the most traumatic things that can happen to a person, their family, their parents, their siblings, their friends, all were cut off and they were left destitute emotionally and socially, all because of a process that is not found anywhere in Scripture. And I defy any witness to show me where the process of disassociation, as practiced by Jehovah's Witnesses, is found in Scripture, even by weird and wonderful interpretations. It's simply not there. Why is it there at all? It seems that back when they first came up with this fellowshipping in the 50s, uh, Brother Franz went to Brother Nor and said, what do we do about people who want to vote or join the military? We can't disfellowship them and get in trouble with the government. So they came up with the idea, oh, well, they're disassociated. They have disassociated themselves. We haven't disfellowshipped them. They've done it to themselves. So they've taken uh, a process and relabeled it. It is a distinction without a difference. And now they apply it to anyone who disagrees with the organization's policies. Anyways, we'll leave it at that for now. I'll let you know how things go as things develop. Thank you for listening. Bye for now.